Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. In this video, we're going to be covering the ethics and legal questions that you're going to be seeing on Step 1. This subject is very important, in my opinion, for your actual careers. Most physicians that lose their license do so because of ethical or legal problems, not because of incompetence clinically. So the, these are important topics and they can get pretty complicated, but thankfully the questions on step one are pretty simple. This subject is not really focused on or emphasized in step one. We can start with the ethical principles, which you can see here at the top right corner. I give a high yield rating of three. For those of you who do not know what that is, it is a rating scale from 0 to 10, giving you a rough estimate for how important each topic is for step one. And if you'd like to learn more about that rating system, you can head to my website here. I give the ethical principles a high yield rating of three because you're unlikely to see many questions specifically asking you about principles. But you also need to keep in mind that if you don't understand these principles, you will have trouble with other questions. First one I'm going to cover is autonomy, which is just respecting the patient's decisions about their own health, as long as they are competent to make that decision for themselves. Non-maleficence is just do no harm, like the Hippocratic Oath. Next one is beneficence, which is promote the patient's best interest, or do what's best for the patient. Most situations will have beneficence and non-maleficence together, because it's kind of hard to separate the two, but they are two different ethical principles. And then we have justice, which is tr trying to distribute medical benefits fairly and not discriminating against any particular group. This principle is generally not applied to scenarios with individual patients. This is more sort of big picture decisions. On a patient by patient basis, you shouldn't really be making treatment decisions based on justice. You don't want to not give somebody a treatment just so you can save money or resources and divert those to other patients who might need it more. Those are more decisions for politicians to make or the heads of hospitals. People are going to make certain rules, guidelines, and laws that will be applied to this principle. Capacity is the mental ability to make informed decisions about their own health. A capacitated individual has to be able to understand the medical information given to them, retain that information, use the information to make an informed decision and then be able to communicate that decision to their providers. Anybody that can do all those things is considered capacitated, but if they're severely limited in one of those areas, they're probably not going to be capacitated. Additionally, the decision they make must be in line with their previous beliefs and not be the result of a psychiatric sy symptom. For example, hallucinations or delusions. Certain things like psychiatric disorders, neurological disease, uh, lack of consciousness, developmental disorders, severe pain, drugs, alcohol, all sorts of things can either temporarily or permanently prevent somebody from being capacitated. And this is important because individuals who are not capacitated cannot give informed consent because they don't have the mental ability to do so. Patients are assumed to be competent until there's substantial proof showing otherwise. So if you just have one or two, so if you just have one or two clinical indicators that a person is not capacitated, or maybe the family just suspects the patient is incapacitated, that's not enough. You need to do a full workup to figure out if somebody is or isn't capacitated because giving somebody that incapacitated label is a big deal. And capacity is pretty similar to the term competence, but competence is a legal term. So capacity is more determined by the physicians and competence is more determined by a judge, even though the two are often used interchangeably. When a patient lacks capacity, the requirement for informed consent is not removed. It's just transferred to somebody else. In most cases, this responsibility is going to be transferred to a family member or friend, but in certain cases where a family member or friend cannot be found, a social worker might also take on this responsibility. In no situation should the physician be making the decision about informed consent for their patient. Deciding which person will speak for an incapacitated patient follows a certain set of criteria. 
The first option is to have the patient speak for themselves through an advanced directive or will. In this case, the pa patient decides ahead of time what sort of treatments they would want in given scenarios. However, there are an infinite number of different scenarios that could arise, so you cannot outline all the possibilities ahead of time. So even in scenarios where there is an advanced directive or will, you still need a person to speak for the patient to help interpret those directions and figure out what the patient would really want. When deciding which person will speak for the patient, the first option is somebody that the patient has selected themselves. This means they are going to identify somebody called a proxy or a surrogate before they become incapacitated, so ahead of time. If the patient has not identified one of these people, then you would go to the closest family member, such as a spouse, and on to children or parents, things like that. And in all of these situations, the individual should be trying to choose what they think the patient would want, not what they would want themselves. Minors, or people under the age of 18, are basically assumed to lack capacity automatically. In these scenarios, the parents have to give consent. And in some cases, confidentiality rules don't apply to everything related to a minor's care. However, the rules of being a minor don't apply to everyone because minors can become emancipated, which means they obtain the right to make their own medical decisions. In these cases, the child or teenager would be considered an adult in reference to these ethical situations and informed consent. There are a handful of different ways to become emancipated. You can file to officially become emancipated if you live on your own and support yourself on your own, then you're automatically considered emancipation even if you don't fill out these certain paperwork. If you're married and under 18, you're emancipated. If you have children of your own or are pregnant, you're also emancipated automatically. In a lot of situations, the parents are going to have access to certain medical history, but there are a few cases where the parents would not have access to this information. And the way I remember this is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's my mnemonic for these situations, which you can see here. Sex would stand for contraception, STDs, and pregnancy. Anything you find during the history or physical related to these things would remain confidential. And if the patient who's a minor wants contraception or wants an STD test, a pregnancy test, or has already been found to be pregnant, you keep that stuff confidential even if the parent asks about it. Additionally, drugs, alcohol, or different drugs of abuse, if you find out through the history or some sort of test the patient has an addiction problem or is undergoing some sort of treatment for the addiction problem, those things should be kept confidential as well. And then rock and roll stands for emergency, which isn't quite confidentiality related, but this rolls into the informed consent situation. If a minor comes in and they're knocked out because they were just in a car accident or something, you don't necessarily need the parent's consent for that situation. In that case, you often can't contact the parents fast enough before you need to start treating the patient, so you have assumed consent in that situation. And informed consent also applies to the sex and drugs. It's not just uh, confidentiality. So. If a patient wants an STD test or treatment for addiction, they can give informed consent for themselves, even if they're a minor. The rules of confidentiality also apply just to the fact that a patient is having sex. So if a parent asks if the kid is having sex, you should not tell them, even if you found that out during the history. The situation with confidentiality and informed consent gets a little more tricky around abortion and that's why you don't really see questions like this on the step one much because it is more complicated. But depending on what state you're in, it's either going to be parental notification or parental consent. That means in some states, a minor will need the parent to give informed consent to get an abortion. And in other situations, the parent needs to be notified within, say, two weeks before the procedure, before it happens. But they don't need to give informed consent. Even if the parent doesn't want it to happen, it still can as long as they've been notified through the proper channels.
So I've mentioned it a few times already, but I guess I should give a definition. So informed consent is the process of describing the different treatment options to a patient and then asking for their permission to move forward with whatever plan they choose. For informed consent to be valid, patient must be given all the relevant information on the treatment plans before making their decision. This includes potential benefits, likely prognosis, potential negative outcomes, the cost, alternative treatments available, and the option to receive no treatment, which is always an option. Physicians not only have to make sure they give all this information to the patients, they also need to make sure the patients can understand it. If you're just spouting out medical information to them that they aren't qualified to interpret, that's your fault, not their fault. You need to put everything in a language that they can understand. Additionally, any decisions have to be made voluntarily by the patient. You can't coerce your patient into doing what you think is best. Competent patients can choose to stop ongoing treatment or refuse starting treatment at any time for any reason. Refusing life-saving medical care is not suicide and it's not automatically considered grounds for deeming a patient incapacitated. Based on the patient's beliefs and wishes, there are numerous situations where denying life-saving care is a rational decision that is made by a competent person. Additionally, refusing one treatment option does not mean they're refusing all treatment options. So you're not abandoning your patient just because they don't want one specific life-saving care. You're still going to do everything else they are okay with and the other treatment options that are available, even if it's just making them more comfortable. Situations at the end of life, especially in patients that are terminal and in pain, can get very complicated ethically because you've got, in some cases, the desires of the patients to want to end their suffering and that is in conflict with other ethical principles of doing no harm. Uh, so these situations can get pretty tricky. Thankfully, they won't go in too much depth on step one for these type of questions because these situations are difficult to summarize in just a couple of sentences. But physician-assisted suicide is only legal in a few states like Oregon, and that usually includes giving an excessively large amount of pain medication to the patient. Even in these few states where it is legal, it happens very rarely. And even though it's legal, the physician is not able to directly administer the drug. They're only allowed to make it available to the patient for them to use themselves. In other states where physician-assisted suicide is not legal, there are still a couple other options. If a terminal patient is in severe pain, a physician can use pain medications to lessen that pain that might have the side effect of depressing respiration. So if you, there's a legitimate medical reason for using the medication, and that legitimate medical reason is your main reason for using the medication, then it's all right. This would have to include using the medically appropriate amount of pain medication for the patient's level of pain. Even if you think that depressing respiration is likely given that dosage, if it's still the medically appropriate amount, you can move forward with that treatment without breaking any laws. And in effect, you're complying with the patient's wish. In any state and in any situation, a patient can always just refuse to eat and drink if they really want to end things. Food and water are just like any other treatment, and any competent patient can refuse those things at any time for any reason, in which case they would likely die of dehydration in a few days. The same would apply to any patients that are being kept alive on any sort of machine. They can refuse that type of care just like they refuse any other type of care. Emergency situations are a little different with informed consent, especially if the patient is incapacitated. In these situations, informed consent is assumed. So if you need to give somebody so if you need to give somebody a certain treatment to keep them alive and it has to be done within the next couple minutes, you're not going to waste time trying to track down somebody like the family member of the patient to try to get informed consent. If it needs to be done right away, you do it right away. And you just assume that the family member and the patient would want those things done. But this assumed consent does not stretch on for days and days. Just because somebody comes in through the emergency room doesn't mean that consent applies throughout. So if the patient becomes conscious, you need to follow normal informed consent protocols for everything from that point forward. And once the patient is stabilized, you need to spend time tracking down some family members or the spouse to try to get informed consent from them if the patient is still unconscious.
Confidentiality is a set of rules and procedures that helps limit the sharing of patients' information with anybody outside of the medical team. Doing so increases trust between the patient and physician while also increasing the volume and quality of information that we are able to receive from the patients. If the patients trust that what they tell you is not going to be spread to other people, they're more likely to give you a thorough history. Confidentiality also prevents the harm caused to a patient by having personal information released to people they did not want to have it. Confidentiality extends even to family members, so you should not discuss the details of the patient's case with their family unless the patient has told you in private that you can do so. Asking the patient in front of their family members if you can talk to their family is a little bit coercive and they may not give you the real answer because they don't want to be mean to their family members. There are some cases where we are required to break confidentiality. Certain disease diagnoses are required to be reported to the proper government organizations for disease surveillance. These would be reportable diseases. And here are a list of some of those. So certain infectious diseases, cancer, TB, STDs, adverse medical events or medical errors, any type of severe violence or life-threatening violence, as well as gunshot wounds need to be reported to the police as well. Confidentiality must also be broken in some cases when abuse is suspected. This would apply to child or vulnerable adult slash elder abuse and neglect. In these cases, these situations need to be reported to the proper authorities so they can be investigated fully. The physicians themselves are not required to figure out what's going on, but if they suspect something is going on, they need to report it but the physicians are obviously not trained to do this sort of investigation. So you don't have to wait until you have enough evidence to say definitively whether abuse or neglect is happening. If you see one or two signs suggesting that something might be happening, that's when you have to report it. These rules of breaking confidentiality for child or elder abuse does not necessarily apply to spousal abuse or intimate partner violence. In those situations, the victim is assumed to be capacitated to make their own decisions about whether or not they want to get authorities involved. So the wife or husband who's being abused does not want to have the incident reported, you don't report it. You're only reporting things automatically for child abuse and elder abuse, in which cases those patients are assumed to not be capacitated to make that decision for themselves. This would also be applied to certain patients with mental disabilities. Here are some signs that would suggest abuse may be happening. If you have multiple unexplained injuries, bruises, healed fractures, burns, retinal injuries in infants, that's one sign that abuse may be happening. If there is general genital trauma in vulnerable adult or child, that may suggest rape has occurred. And STDs in a child who, who we would assume wouldn't get those through consensual sex it's going to be another sign that rape could be happening. And here are some signs of neglect, things like poor hygiene, failure to thrive in a child or infant, malnutrition, dehydration, poor grooming, basically just any sign that shows that they are not being taken care of properly.